officially welcome IRB. We would like to record this if that's. Um, um, I hope we have asked you about this, Maureen and Gary. I no, but that's that. okay. You haven't asked, but I don't mind. I don't mind either. I you love. I love publicity. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. I always assume we asked before, but okay. <laughs> Little glitch in our own coordination here. So, um, but then uh, thank you for this as well. Thanks for joining. Thanks everyone for joining. Um, this is, as some of you know, becoming a bit of a habit, our convergence lecture. And what we mean by it is, of course, um, the convergence or the integration of human and machine in translation and interpreting according to our own program that we have here. And I think um, the two speakers we have today, um, for me, totally incorporate that. So this is uh, going to be um, a very good alignment with what we are all interested in. Um, Maureen and Gary, I think I've known you, I don't know how long I've actually known you, but <laughs> um, through many international conferences, of course, where you are both very active and uh, what, uh, um, so obviously are both placed in, in, in Zurich at the Institute of Translation and Interpreting. Um, at the Zurich University of Applied Sciences. Um, Gary, I hope it is true that you are still running the show as the director. <laughs> is that correct? <laughs> Absolutely. And, uh, and um, both of you, what, what I've always found really fascinating, both of you involved um, both in, this, in the teaching of the uh, master's and undergraduate programs, as well as in research and trying to bring this together with the very applied um, types of research that Again, um, we here in Surrey uh, appreciate very much and are very interested in. So when I when I when I see the two of you and one does see you often together, which is lovely, <laughs> um, I think of uh, translation process research. I think of the whole question of uh, cognitive ergonomics. And so I think the one goes to Gary Moore and the other goes to Maureen Moore. But we know you work together very much. Um, so questions, especially around um, the shape the future shape also of the translator's workplace. So really this question, what, where is the human translator today in the 21st century? Um, that's, that's what I um, really connect and, and link to you. And then of course, also all the related and equally important associated questions that go into what do we do with all this knowledge and the knowledge that, for example, you have gathered in, in several empirical projects, and what do we do with that in translation, uh, translator education, translator training, which is, of course, equally important to us here, that, that question. And I see many colleagues here from translation centers who will be very um, uh, interested in that link uh, as well. So today, the topic is exactly like that. It's the face or the interface um, um, of the uh, translator today. and. Um, I don't know in which order you had planned to speak, so I leave that entirely, of course, up to you and uh, would like to also hand over to you. Please, one more thank you to come and talk to us. Thank you very much, Sabina. I'll be starting, so I'll share my screen and I'll be in charge of the screen. Um, and that means that if anything, if there are any glitches, it's my fault and Gary can just relax. <laughs> so no, I... Good. I can see, I assume you can see it. The reason I'm in this picture is just because this is our official CC corporate communications picture for research. It's really not that I like putting myself in the center, but um, yeah, that happens to be me. And I'm standing in front of an American and Swiss, two, two flags, American and Swiss. I'm not American, I'm Canadian, just to set that straight. Um, and I'm also Swiss. So yeah, that's that's a bit of who I am. We're very happy to be here virtually with you um, and the title, the interface. So we'll be talking about faces of professional translation and also interfaces. Um, and I think the plan is that we speak and then there's Q&A afterwards. Now the first challenge, here we go. So <laughs> I, I, I used this picture um, this summer when I was part of a summer school that was supposed to happen in Forli, Italy, and then had to put online, um, just to, to sort of remind ourselves of technology and communication technology. Um, the first row, there's not a lot of communication going on there, but you see someone holding a book very at the end of the first row. And then from then on, it's all about communication and all of the interfaces and, and faces that we have involved. And this is a promo picture that we use in some of our presentations that was taken um, in our research associates office. And we can see 
two screens and someone looking very happy doing translation work and chatting. And the reality of professional translation is there's not a whole lot of chatting at a desk that goes on, but it, it's a nice idea. These are some of the interfaces, at least some of the um, logos behind the interfaces that those of you who are involved in professional translation or research into professional translation might be familiar with. I won't try to go into all of these. I just thought it was a nice um, compilation of all these different things that we're coping with. These are two screenshots from quite a few years ago when we first started doing translation process research at our institute. Gary and I were involved in a project called Capturing Translation Processes. Uh, and people were using Word, basically. Um, and one of the things we got interested in is which is better, um, left and right layout or top and bottom layout. And you can see some eye tracking dots overlaid and, and the answer it turns out is it depends on what you're doing. If you're doing revision work, it's probably left, right. Um, if you're doing creative, more creative work, translation from scratch, probably top and bottom makes more sense. Trados, those of you who know Trados, switched to left, right quite a few years ago and we approached them to ask why. We thought they'd done empirical research or at least surveys or something. No, they just thought it was a good idea. Um, that was the old layout. So here we have um, this top bottom layout. Uh, here it started to get busier. That was this quite a few years ago. And this is more like what Trados looks like right now, although that's not exactly what Trados looks like anymore. It, it's getting busier and busier, um, which interests us as well. How busy can an interface get before it's counterproductive for people using it? When you start talking about other kinds of professional translation work, AVT, there's an even more information happening. You're dealing with different modalities. Sabina, you can say a lot more about this, I'm sure. Um, and there are different looks to this as well. So the kinds of information people are expected to be able to cope with, um, how reasonable it is, where the attention is, these are all questions that interest us in our research. Gary, I'm going to turn the floor over to you to talk about the faces of professional translation in the industry. Thank you very much, Maureen. I hope everybody can hear me if you just put your thumbs up. Good. Excellent. Thank you very much. Yes. So from the interfaces to the faces. And uh, basically, when we're talking about the faces of professional translation, I think it's best to, to look at where we stand, to look at the industry. Um, interfaces change and the, uh, the industry itself is changing its face pretty rapidly. We all know that. And uh, the industry is obviously where what we still call translators, we definitely used to call translators, and perhaps we might be calling something different in future, actually work. Now, that face decisively determines the, the tasks and the tools and the responsibilities and the roles of, of the language professionals, the face of that, that industry in which they, 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 they work, but also the professionals we are educating to join the profession and the activities and professions that, uh, that it is our job actually to investigate, to look at. Um, that industry is growing fast, Maureen, if you go to the next slide. Um, if we look at the uh, valuations that we have of the industry, uh, depending on which uh, organization is doing that, uh, we have NIMSI evaluating the industry uh, currently at around, uh, estimating the value at 58.3 billion, um, Slater 26.2 billion. Slater, incidentally, a highly recommended business intelligence platform on the language industry run by a, a graduate of ours, Florian Fees, uh, out of Zurich, but it's a very good uh, source of information on the industry. And it's, uh, it's, it's where we take a lot of our inspiration from when we're looking at, um, at the way the industry works and the way the professionals kind of slot into that industry. Now, as you see, that industry is growing strong and fast despite the inevitable stuttering that the pandemic brought on. And um, the projected annual growth rates are pretty high uh, for, for, for any industry, really, uh, constantly between 5 and 
Um, now, <clears throat> a major driver of this is, of course, the technology. The technology in general, which promises huge productivity gains and obviously artificial intelligence in the form of neural machine translation in particular that we all know about. Maureen, if you can go to the next slide. Now, uh, this actually is decisively affecting the phase of professional translation per se. Um, if we just look at um, something, uh, a comment basically, uh, by an industry expert, uh, Jab van der Meer, in this case, of the influential uh, translator, uh, translator Automation User Society, a, a leading commentator, really, and analyst on what's going on in the industry in terms of artificial intelligence and, and machine translation. He actually tells us that, um, that for the first time, really, in this phase, uh, we've got a case where automatic translation is entering the real translation economy. It's always been on the margin, but it's entering the core, the real translation economy. And this, of course, means profound changes now and ahead. But Yap perhaps is a little bit exaggerated when he uh, goes so far as to deny a place for the human translator in the process. Though it, again, depends on how you define what a translator is. I mean, certainly in terms of the way in which we conceptualized a tra translation, say, 10, 20, 30 years ago, I think he could be right. But there are still roles for the translators. And uh, if we go to the next slide, we see exactly where. Now, what Yap was doing was picking, is in many ways picking up on a hype that's been going on for about five years, we all know about basically, um, you know, the huge explosion of, 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 of claims about uh, what NMT can and cannot do. <clears throat> but, um, you know, we remember the quotes from 2016 and then 2018 uh, regarding human parity in translation, regarding, <clears throat> sorry, bridging gaps between human and machine translation. The reality, is nevertheless somewhat different. And uh, those who are involved and who know about this, such as Yap himself, who will say that the role of professional translators will not vanish, sounds a little bit of a contradiction to what he said uh, on, the, on the previous slide. But um, again, it depends on the way you conceptualize translators. Translation in its, in its traditional sense is perhaps gonna vanish or change, but it's gonna evolve again through technology. Now, Andy Way, uh, equally uh, in the know about these, these issues, uh, working out of DCU, and I'm sure a few of our DCU colleagues are maybe here uh, today. He again um, talks about the human in the loop, obviously, and about the fact that, again, the human will always remain the most important link in such a chain. Um, empty systems basically increase productivity, and this is exactly what we've been seeing in the industry over the last few years, a huge increase in productivity. If you could move on. Right. Now, um, <clears throat> a more perhaps balanced view overall of, of the way in which the industry is moving and the way in which commentators are perceiving the, the role of the human translator in the industry. Um, is one put forward by, by Florian Fays, whom I mentioned. Uh, we invited him along to do an interview for our students and our institute. And during that interview, which is online, and perhaps at some stage, if you're interested, we can share that interview with you with a link. Um, he says that obviously MT is amazingly good, but that he has not seen any industry disruption. Um, there, is, uh, the, there are huge growing volumes. Uh, uh, that means that any efficiency gains are compensated by the volumes, by, by, the, by basically the, uh, the, 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 the demand. Um, but what, it has, what has happened uh, is that quality expectations have gone up, meaning that language mediators, translators, really have to be, and V quote says, even better. Now, of course, this increases the value of human language mediation and the perceived value of language mediation or translation. Um, quality, high quality, becomes attainable and is therefore itself driving demand in the human translation sector. And what's happening also is that because of increased automation, because of 
the way in which the uh, uh, the the the, the, the technolo technology is impacting on the industry, but also the way in which the industry is perceiving itself. We've got a huge diversification of the profiles and roles of those who are actually working in it. Um, as an example, in this interview, Florian mentioned post-editing, of course, language data create, uh, curation, all known to us as well, and transcreation. Now, if we go to the next slide now, um, his own uh, business intelligence agency has a, a language industry report every year, and last year's language industry market report. Um, in it, he, 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 he describes a kind of research project that was done by his particular institution, uh, by his particular, by Slater, uh, in which they, they compiled a list of industry titles, job titles. Now there are 700 of these in 2020. Now, of course, some of them will be replicated. Some of them are, you know, various permutations on the word translator, or permutation. but I mean, the fact that we've got 700 titles suggests that we've got a certain diversification that goes beyond what we see as, or we have traditionally seen as a translator. If we go on, Maureen. And this is just a compilation of those kind of roles that we see. We, get, we, we, we have translators, the people that we educate for the markets of the future and uh, of, of, of the present, really, you are working in accessibility, data curation, term management, post-editing, AVT, transcreation, intercultural mediation. Uh, some of them move into user experience, technical documentation, so on and so forth. Basically, you've got a huge proliferation of, of, of tasks and roles um, that we have to address. Can we go on? Now, what's been happening? Well, we do have, of course, um, in the industry itself, a concentration and maintenance of the core services. But what seems to have been happening, again, this is borne out by data that Slater and others have collected, we see a kind of broadening of the spectrum of, of work that's being done by, uh, by translators themselves, or those whom we have called translators up till now. Um, first of all, there are, there's a proliferation of upstream services being offered by language service providers, largely in the area of content production, multilingual text production, marketing PR, corporate communications and design, uh, technical writing being classic upstream services. But we also have a movement downstream of the core services. Uh, legal requirements, conformity, concepts of accessibility, content management, QA, um, uh, product distribution, data management, analysis, consulting. This, is, this all belongs to the industry. And increasingly, we're seeing that our students and uh, uh, professionals who have been working in one sphere are moving across into these other areas. A classic example being, of course, the way in which nowadays at the European Parliament, for instance, translators are no longer translators. They are um, cultural and linguistic mediators, and they are working in content production and downstream areas, as well as offering the core services. If you can go on. Right. Now, um, post-editing, just to take up one um, shall we say, slightly new task that has been emerging within the core service area downstream to the extent that uh, it's the end of, end, of, end of workflow really area uh, is post-editing. Now, this is just an example of the way in which, of course, the tools, as I said, and the technologies that are being used are changing for the translator and therefore the way the translator interacts with his or her environment. Now, interestingly enough, um, the task is, has been described as boring and tedious with translators often reflecting that they have been robbed of their creativity. Um, presumably that can be compensated if you move upstream to content creation. But what's interesting is that actually increasingly uh, the perception of post-editing as this rather static kind of um, um, piece of work actually puts the human in a slightly more central position in the, route, in the loop. It's not necessarily uh, a position where, the, uh, where you are basically just editing and working as a slave to the machine because adapting
active MT now forms part of um, of major um, uh, translation management, translation uh, memory tools. And uh, when a sentence from MT is edited, the system learns from it. So basically, the human is actually involved within the creative loop, or sorry, sorry to say, the, the quality loop by which the, uh, the machine actually learns. And if we look at the final quotation here, um, this actually changes uh, cognitive tasks um, to a task that is closer to that of revision by a human of translations produced by a human. In other words, we're not necessarily with these tools moving into that kind of um, slave to machine perception that has been the case in the past regarding post-editing. And now I'll give uh, the floor back to you, Maury. Thank you. So humans in the loop is what we'd like to zero in on. Um, this is a visualization by a recent report by Slater. And he's talking, they were talking about MT engines and MT engines um, and the human linguists. And I think if I'm correct in England, you tend to talk about linguists, meaning what we would call language professionals um, rather than translators. So the human linguist is in the middle um, and there's a loop that goes round. And I want to zero in on the, the questions that have arisen if we think about who is that person in the loop, the main person we could argue that's driving the process. So one is the effective interfaces on working processes. That's something that I started with and we've certainly explored um, the effect of translation memory suggestions, cat tool matches on decision making is something that people have explored to a certain extent and is certainly worth exploring more as we see MT moving into cat tools. What interests us is the influences of technology on thinking, so on cognitive processes, how we interact with this technology and whether it, for example, primed us if we see an MT suggestion or an NMT suggestion, does that prime us to think in a certain direction or does that trigger creative solutions? And there hasn't been much work done on this yet. Some PhDs are just coming out, some um, people are just starting to talk about this. So the priming effects is something that's usually considered negatively, that it forces us to think a certain way. And we have lots of anecdotal evidence from translators, professional translators saying that they have to kind of block that. But we also have evidence from translators who say they find it very helpful that they get an, a suggestion from either translation memory or M, um, an MT suggestion, and that gets them thinking in a new direction. Uh, so the influences on creativity, if, if MT and technology, other kinds of technology is taking away the, the boring aspect, this is something Sharon O'Brien talked about very early, um, taking away the boring work, then we have more cognitive resources for more interesting work, which is what we're good at, humans are good at. So the workplace research um, that we have done, uh, we'd like to give, give some examples uh, into the situated activity of translation and using drawing on the ergonomics projects, so the ergonomics of technology, uh, technologized translation work we thought would be interesting in the context of this lecture. Now, when we talk about workplace research in the field, Hannah Risku and her group have been um, leading proponents of this and pushing us forward. Um, the theoretical frameworks and approaches that she talks about in those two articles that are both referenced there, um, the cognitive, the sociological, um, and the ergonomic. And the cognitive approach, and we ascribe to that as well, um, is for e research or for EA, so embedded, embodied, uh, and acted. And there's another E, um, embedded, embodied. I've lost the fourth E. Um, and then A is affective, which not everybody talks about, but the influence of, of emotions or affect. I found on, the, I found the, sorry to interrupt, thank extended. You. Extended, thank you. Yeah. Extended. Um, so we've got this cognitive approach with this notion of translation or language work as a situated activity, meaning it's not just happening in our head within the confines of our skull is how we understand this, that we're, we're human beings that are affected by what's happening around us, by our environment, 
by our social environment, what's happening in discourse, um, what somebody said to me this morning as I was walking to work, all these things have an influence, of course, on us. Sociological, she draws on actor network theory, which we also refer to sometimes, and practice theory. Um, Maeve Olohan has, has talked about practice theory. Um, and the ergonomic, which is something that we started quite a long time ago when Gary attended a conference organized by um, Elizabeth Lavolion um, back in the day where we could have conferences live. Uh, talking about using an approach that puts has been putting people in the center of activities and of work for a long time, ergonomics, and they break it down into the physical, cognitive, and organizational dimensions. And some other people whose names you recognize, Carlos Teixeira, Sharon O'Brien, have also worked within this perspective. So if you do work place research in the field, in our experience, we have various methods we can draw on and then there are caveats associated with those. So of course you can do observations um, in the workplace, you can do ethnographic um, research, field notes, video recordings, um, video recordings we've used in the workplace um, and audio recordings can be used in the workplace but uh, translation workplaces are often very quiet. It's not much happening or it seems that there's not much happening. In fact, there's a lot happening on the screen. But if an observer comes into a translation in LSP, there'd be people on the phone, the project managers, but the people who are actually doing the translation work are probably staring into their screens and it doesn't seem like there's an awful lot happening. And the problem, of course, if you're there watching, you have this observer paradox or the white coat paradox. So how can you be a fly on the wall and not affect what people are doing when they know you're interested in what they're doing? Methods, self-report have been used a lot for workplace research, and I'm going to be talking about some self-report research that we did with all of the normal caveats associated with that. So the decontextualization, when you ask someone not in the workplace what they do at the workplace, what are you really getting at? But surveys, interviews, focus groups, activity logs have all been used. And then translation process research techniques in mixed method approaches, which is what we have tried to do with more and less success in the workplace um, or also in the lab. In the lab, of course, you've got the problem of decontextualization with unfamiliar tools. We were very surprised when we had professionals come into our usability lab and found that they were very disoriented by having a different keyboard. And in Switzerland, um, there is a Swiss keyboard with the, the umlaut keys uh, letters in a certain place. And if we had a German person come into the lab, which we had, and they not, were not used to using a Swiss keyboard, they were completely disoriented. So these, what seem to be tiny things can have huge effects on people's work, of course. And that's not even mentioning if you're using um, a different CAT tool, for example. So it'd be nice to have 50 tra professional translators come in and test a CAT tool. But if those 50 translators are not familiar with that particular CAT tool, what are you really testing? Um, infrastructure, of course, ambient factors, um, interoperability, so whether soft and hardware work together. All of these caveats um, can be overcome. Um, we've talked about how to do so, or how we tried to do so in our research. Joanna had a very interesting PhD project um, where she used distant, uh, remote techniques before people were worrying about that very much. Of course, in Corona times, uh, a lot of people probably are thinking about how we can collect data remotely. The benefits, um, we're convinced about the benefits of doing workplace research in the field um, because of ecological validity, that's the big one. But the challenges, of course, is finding partners who don't have their own agenda. Uh, the first partner that we worked with, it turned out they wanted to find out why some of the language combinations seem so much slower doing annual reports than the other language combination. We couldn't answer that question because they discovered that we were not allowed to watch the processes during annual report season because they were completely confidential. So we didn't have to answer that particular question. But you have to be careful when you're working with um, partners just to make sure that they're on board in a way that doesn't compromise your own research ethics. When participants volunteer, they're self-selecting. Um, so they're probably highly motivated because you're not going to get at the ones who are not motivated if they're volunteers. 
Um, and of course, how can you compare texts that are completely different? How can you compare completely different tasks? In the workplace, things are completely different. You don't have 20 translators translating the same text into the same language. That just doesn't happen, obviously. So how do you cope with that? Confidentiality, IT security, getting informed consent. Is it truly informed? Do they really know what they're signing on for? Protecting anonymity, protecting the translators from their own employers if they're completely honest about if they're wanting to be completely honest about something that they're not going to fear that their employers are going to then accuse them of being disloyal for example and reputational issues associated with the employer um, if we discover that some of their process really make no sense and, and producing poor quality where they could be producing better quality um, that's not a good thing for the the world to hear about so those sorts of things are all um, interesting challenges to deal with. In our experience, um, employers possibly are a bit more hesitant sometimes to take part than employees are. Uh, translators are usually very happy to have people come in and talk to them about what they're doing. Benefits are also feedback loops. If you have a partner on board um, in an applied project, in a transdisciplinary project, they're learning, you're learning, and they're learning. Participants and organizations um, have to adapt, learn, develop, and change with the research. And, and if they change with the research, then you have to, it's a bit of a moving target. Your original research questions might have to change. But there's transformational relevance to praxis and to education, which is why we believe in it. Um, it's just sometimes diff very difficult to do, obviously. Sometimes it's very, it's, it seems a lot easier to invite people to the lab to do things under controlled conditions, which is why one project I'm involved in right now is very much a lab project, I have to confess. The project I'd like to zero in on right now is the ergonomics uh, project that Gary and I were involved in a couple of years ago. Um, and, and one of the things that was driving us was health. And of course, the, what we've learned over the last two years is um, that we were a bit pre prescient with our project everyone's talking about ergonomics now. Uh, people were not talking about ergonomics a few years ago and the translators who took part in our, our study were very happy that someone was finally worrying about their ergonomic conditions. And the health issues that were identified that were related to translation work were worrying. I mean, of the population, over 60% identified pain in the neck, neck stiffness, shoulder pain, um, discomfort and pain, in arms or hands. So these things that now all of us are becoming very familiar with, um, translators had early experience with. I would argue because of that, I think a lot of the translators were in a better position to handle the conditions of going to remote work than some other people were because a lot of them had been doing this. We talk about learning from negative experience and a lot of our translators who took part in, in our studies told us that they'd had to buy an ergonomic mouse, they had to buy a new chair, they had to um, buy a second screen because they realized that they were hurting when they didn't do it. And what we are trying to do in our education programs is to get people to think about this before they're hurting. If you recognize yourself in that picture, that's not a good thing. The idea is that you're sitting like this in a perfectly ergonomic position. The problem is a lot of the ergonomic recommendations, and this one is from Canada, um, that it assumes that you're working on a computer screen in sort of a normal way. And the reality of professional translation when you're working with a cat tool is you're not looking at a screen in a normal way because the area of interest for you might be way down low on the screen. And when we did our ergonomics project, we found that a lot of translators had lifted up their screens. They lifted them as high as they could go based on the, the pedestal the screen was on, plus they'd put them on books, usually old dictionaries that they weren't using anymore, to get it higher. And our organizational health people couldn't understand until we looked at the screen recordings and realized that the area of interest, what they were actually looking at in the cat tool was now at the right position. So physical aspects based on our review of the literature, based on insurance company recommendations, based on ergonomic recommendations, these would be good practice rec indications for translation work, for professional translation work. And I don't know 
if you can say yes to all of those things. The survey participants, and there were 1,850 overall when we did this survey, they couldn't say yes to all of these things. And I've just indicated in red where it's worrying um, and in yellow where it might be worrying and there's room for improvement. And green is good. Green is where people, basically over 80% of the people were saying, yes, that's exactly what I have. The magnification of the screen not being adjusted, I find extraordinary. So it's suggested to us that people have an interface, there's a default setting and they stay with the default setting to their own detriment. And we saw people leaning forward. And if you ever feel that you're leaning forward to your screen, you might wanna think about changing the magnification as well. And I see, I look around my um, open plan office when I'm allowed to go to work and I see people doing that all the time. And then I ask them, why don't you increase the magnification? Oh, oh where do you do that? How, the, the bother seems too much. I pulled out the UK responses. I thought that might be interesting for you. There were not quite 10% of the responses came from the UK. And we see the pattern is very similar to the international survey as a whole. There, the magnification problem seems a little bit less. So it could be that the UK translators who responded to our survey were a little bit ahead of the game. Cognitive aspects. At the time we designed the survey, we were not as smart as we think we are now. We had some questions related to cognitive aspects and to um, interface aspects. If I were to redo the survey, I'd have a lot more questions in this area. But we did have some questions. I worked with Sharon O'Brien um, uh, to derive some of these questions because she was very interested at the time and with cat tools. Um, these would be good practice indications, cat tools are helpful indeed um, and that when people say that they're helpful at least sometimes they're probably using them properly if they're not having to switch between cat tools and we discovered in our um, analysis of the results that some people had nine different cat tools that they were having to switch because they had clients who wanted them to use different tools um, did they customize aspects did they find them not irritating because if you find something irritating that can't be good um, and if you did find it irritating, or if you did, you make any comments about that? And what we discovered is, yes, yeah, they, they're irritating. Um, only eight percent of the respondents in the overall survey said that they didn't find things irritating, or they didn't make any comments about it when they said they were irritating. So we have lots of problems with cat tools being mentioned. The UK is very similar, but a higher uptake in using cat tools. And this is a couple of years ago. And I suspect if I did this survey now, we'd have professional translators more like 90, 95% of people using cat tools. What we found um, in both the subpopulation of UK and also the total was if people use them, they were helpful at least sometimes. So the word is yes for professional translation. This is a good idea. The little stars, I forgot to mention, but it says at the bottom, um, we, we looked at differences between freelance translators, commercial translators working for language service um, providers or within companies and institutional translators, people like EU translators or people working for, for government agencies. And there were significant differences. Where Gary and I got more and more interested was in organizational aspects. And again, if I were to do the survey now, so that I throw the, the gauntlet out to any of you and you're welcome to contact me if you would like to see this the survey. I've had some PhD students write to me and I've sent it to anybody who wants to follow up on this research. I would also ask different questions, but basically the questions we had that were related to organizational aspects of professional translation work are listed here. And we see that, yes, internet connection is mostly are always good. Professional translation is dependent on that. Communication was mostly are always adequate. The deadlines were mostly are always clear. And the timing of the breaks were self-determined, at least sometimes. So that was all good. Bad is that workflow software was not being used. And we know that workflow software can really ease tasks. So people were not doing things as efficiently as they could, which causes cognitive load, we assume. Um, also, there was time pressure, not 
mostly or always, only 51% were able to say that it was not mostly or always time pressure. In other words, people were operating under time pressure most of the time. Um, resources being provided by clients, mm, sometimes. Um, feedback about their work, mm, sometimes. These are warning signs. And hourly breaks, at least sometimes, even though they said they could determine their breaks, they weren't doing it. They were sitting longer than they probably should have. And these are all causes of concern. And the pattern for the UK subgroup is exactly the same. If we zero in on the CAT tool use, um, Sharon O'Brien and I published an article uh, in 2017 that we did with two MA students where they really looked at all of the comments and there were hundreds and hundreds of comments in six different languages. So that was fun that we had two translation MA students working on this because they could cover all of the languages. And, and these were um, the codes to um, categorize what areas, the so user interface was a big one, 28%. That was the largest category where people were irritated by it. Cat tool functionality, second place, technical performance, third place, the appearance of the text. And then there were some other categories that were large enough to be of note. When I look at, this is taken from a study that Martin Kaplis from our institute and I did um, in 2019 and was published in 2020. This is an, a newer version of Trados and you can see it's getting busier and busier. So we've got segment matches from translation memory up on the upper left, we've got matches from term recognition, upper right. Um, here we have on the left, the source text, we have on the right, the emerging target text. We see information about the level of the matches. So 96% or 99%, 100% match, for example. And then there's even sub-segment matches that come from various sources. So as a translator starts to type, Trato, the system, um, SEO will offer some sub-segment matches, which can be good or it can be disturbing. A lot of people say they just ignore it. These sub-segment matches are coming from automatic translation. They're machine translation suggestions. Just zeroing in on this one, those of you, <laughs> Sabina, you're um, in a privileged position here because you can um, read German. So this translator is bis D, so until the, and then machine translation comes with all kinds of possibilities of what might be next. Um, from the mother to the nuts, based on what the system came up with. Um, and then as the translator started to write nuts, then we got lots more. What we see is that translators often will type the whole suggestion in. And, I, and we thought, why is that? The suggestion is there. They could just click on tab and get that suggestion filled in. And a lot of them say, oh, I'm just as fast if I just type it. It's not very good for carpal tunnel syndrome. Um, and we need to educate people on that. But it seems that shifting their attention from one to the other was a disturbance in the cognitive process. And maybe subconsciously they're using that machine translation suggestion. So that suggests there might be room for some research here. This is a different interface, um, and this is Star Transit, and you can see just how many different kinds of information are being offered here. So context match, that comes from translation memory, or term-based match from terminology database, um, MT output, a fuzzy match, so not 100%, something under, depending on what's been set, and sub-segment matches. And this color coding, is this a good thing or a bad thing? So the more functionalities that are being introduced into these interfaces, um, it's not necessarily the more is better, which is what we got interested in. And we did a little study and we worked with MA students. We were not working with professional translators here. MA students who had had a little bit of experience with CAT tools, they'd become a bit familiar with this one, which is LILT, which is a very lean interface. I don't know if you know LILT, um, but you had the source text is given. And this is what I find interesting about LILT is that they've gone back to this um, top bottom layout. So the source text is at the top. And then here, the target text editor, um, you know, the emergent target text. And here, uh, gray, you can see 
These were suggestions from the system, machine translation suggestions. And then as the translator types, more suggestions come and it's adaptive. So the based on what the translator is um, typing, the, the algorithm recalculates and comes up with new suggestions. We tried this out with MA students who'd had about an hour's training on this and they'd had a bit more training on, uh, sorry, that was a bit too fast. They had more training with Trados and we compared the Trados, the, that picture I showed you before with Lilt. And we did it in the usability lab. And here we see a heat map of an attention with a, translating the longest segment of each text. So we had two different texts comparable in every measure we could possibly think of. And we had them first try, translate with Trados and then with Lilt. And here we see a bit of attention up in the segment matches, MT suggestions, not a lot of attention, but a little bit. Here we see some attention, fortunately, on the source text. They are reading the source text, that's good to know. And then we see this is just taken while they're translating that longest segment. We see that there's a tension earlier in the source text and not just in that segment. And here we see that there's attention all over the place. It could be because they're going up to check out what's happening up here. And it, there's a widespread of attention. In Lilt, it's much quieter, a much quieter picture. The focus is on exactly that segment. There's a little bit of checking up above, a little bit checking below what's coming which is interesting, we hadn't expected that, but the focus is very much on that segment. We looked at quantitative measures. So how many keystrokes did they make per target text character or per word? How many mouse clicks? So these were effort indicators. Um, how many deletions? And we also looked at qualitative measures and Lilt won every time. So these two texts, that we thought were as comparable as possible, it seemed for every efficiency measure we could come up with, Lilt was better. And we zeroed in on qualitative measures. So there were three comparable segments and they were rated by eight raters. Lilt won it knows as well. For MA students at least, people who are not very familiar with CAT tools, it could be the cleaner, the leaner, the better. Keep interfaces simple. Gary, what do you understand by all this? Uh, well, I understand quite a lot of detail. Um, I, there's a lot I don't understand. But what I've noticed is during your presentation, the way you are speculating on the possibilities and how we can learn from this. And I think this is where we have to step back a bit, scale back up a bit and move from the last example, which is a lag example, a lab example, back into what we were talking about regarding workplace research and concepts of organizational ergonomics. If we do that, then what we see in everything that we're doing is a model underlying the research, the investigations we've been doing. And those investigations, the, the model is basically one of uh, socio-technical uh, interactivity. So we've got the human translators, the egg, <laughs> the smaller egg, shall we say, within an environment and interacting with that, that environment, including the tools, but also perhaps the uh, physical environment and also the social environment. And the socio-technical systems in which that workplace environment is embedded in terms of the organization or even the broader community in which that organization is based, all impinging influencing the work of the human translators or the linguists, but also with the linguists and the human translators having a, a, a potential and an actual influence on both, if need be, if necessary. Now, the reason I'm saying this is because what we, uh, what we, what we found out quite early from the research we were doing, both in the workplace and in the lab, um, beginning in the lab really, was that the people we invited in we're actually saying, hey, actually, I'm learning something from actually doing this and looking at the way I'm working and the way you're, you're talking to me about the way I'm working, particularly with the retrospective verbal protocols and so on. And then when we did the workplace research with, uh, we, did, we, did, we did work with the European Parliament uh, on, uh, on ergonomics, workplace research, and there, there, was, a, there was a significant learning effect that, uh, that we saw as well. Um, 
obviously we were learning as researchers, we were learning as, as a research institution, and we were feeding that learning directly into our, into our teaching, the teaching of our students who would be perhaps, well, because they're Swiss, they won't probably work for the European Parliament, but perhaps the Council of Europe, we don't know. Um, but the point I think is that, that when I went into the, I, I had as part of, part of this, this research, I went into an organization, I conducted a group interview. And during that group interview, this kind of um, focus group session where we're talking about the ergonomics, there were, we, there, were, there, were, there were distinct and clear learning effects on both parts. I was learning, but they were learning. And we had people from the commission there and they were talking to people from the parliament and suddenly things were learning to the extent that, Actually, the, uh, the, the, as an immediate result of this, uh, this, this interview, which was for research purposes, um, primarily, there, there was an initiative launched at the European Parliament based on the principles of the European Commission. Despite having the same name European in front, they don't tend to talk to each other, but they were talking to each other and learning from each other. Now, that's a fairly, perhaps a trivial example but if we go back to what one of the points where that, that Maureen mentioned a few slides ago, namely that, um, that one of the caveats, one of the challenges of doing workplace research is that the organizations are adapting as you're doing the research. Well, that actually is a huge strength of the research, of that type of research, namely, namely that there are industrial partners and our, our practice partners, those involved in the research will collaboratively with us develop solutions. It's, it's difficult if we're looking at research as in terms of putting things in a test tube and seeing what happens. It's less difficult if you see our research as a productive, transformative, or as we call, next slide please Maureen, transdisciplinary approach to research. And this is, I think, where both of us would say that workplace research in particular, but perhaps applied translation research in general should be moving towards the concept of transdisciplinary action research, TDAR. It's not a hugely well-known concept, but it is used and is growing in, inf in influence in psychology, in social sciences, and in organizational sciences. What are its benefits? Well, it's, it's based broadly on the concept of action research. We'll come to that in a second and how that's structured. But ultimately it involves collaboration of researchers with the communities of practice and the organizations that they are actually looking at. In other words, you are working together with them to achieve a goal. You are not observing, you are acting. Hence the word acting, action research with productive results. Now, ultimately the basic impetus for this is, is, is concentrating on life world, what's called life world problems or real life problems. Um, there's an integration of many disciplinary paradigms. In other words, it's a very interdisciplinary approach involving psychological approaches or the type of mixed method research that we've been doing, ergonomics research. Key is the participatory element of all people involved in it, um, uh, which will look theoretically in a way towards a unity of knowledge that goes beyond the disciplines, but there are clear feedback effects and learning effects on the way to that goal ultimately. And it's something that in particular we find would be a very useful way forward to find out what on earth is going on as our industry is evolving, because actually it puts us in on the ground floor and it gives us a chance. And I mean, us, the researchers, the translating training institutes, the, the people who, who, who look at translation, a chance to actually influence or shape to a certain extent the way that that community, the translation industry, could evolve. We will certainly learn from it, but they can also learn from us. And if you go to the next slide, basically the concept is a very simple one for transdisciplinary action research. And it's based on the very simple action research circle, basically. You know, whether you're a teacher or a psychologist or a social scientist, if you want to indulge in action research, your aim is to plan to improve something. You then act to implement that plan. You observe and describe the effects of that plan. You reflect on it. You evaluate the income, and then you draw up a new plan. It's a very, very simple cycle. It's a cycle that apes very closely the experiential learning cycle of people like Coyle. It's very, very clear. Now, basically, 
this is where we're going and what we, without knowing it actually at the stage we were doing it, it's precisely what we have been doing. And if I just ask you to click again, what we have ultimately here through this core principle of action research, a very distinct possibility to transform our research, our education, but also at the same time, the communities of practice and organizations with which we are involved through doing such action research. Now, this is an idealized plan and there are messy bits and it's very fuzzy, but ultimately I, and I'm sure Maureen agrees totally with me, it was just from a publication I did this year sometime, but um, in this case, I said it, but Maureen and I are on, this, and on, the same, on the same page very much in this respect. We basically are seeing this as the future of at least applied translation research or one possible future. I do think that there is a place for lab research, don't get me wrong, but I'm saying that if we really want to do something and if we really want to get on the ground floor now when the industry is so demonstrably changing and where we perhaps are not talking about translators, but a whole range of activities related to the core concept of mediation, then I think we can do worse than go out there, look at what they're doing, help them to improve what they're doing, and thereby help to improve what we're doing. And that's my last word. Thank you very much indeed. And in the next slide, we just basically say thank you to all the people who gave us the money to do this. And did all the work. <laughs> of course, <laughs> as well. And I'll just name a few names. I mean, we've got uh, the Swiss National Foundation, we've got various in institutional partners, uh, we've got uh, freelance translators, we've got our own teachers involved, and we've got a research team, Andrea Honsekehit, Martin Kapos, Anina Meyer, Martin Schuler, Fera Ebescher, Michel Gasser, Ursula Maida, Zika Neumann, uh, and ourselves, including Heidrun Becker, as uh, the key investigators of the Ergotrans project. And if we go one further, for those of you interested, there have been, and this is a little bit of self-advertisement, but I think we're allowed to do that. Um, we've got some major uh, research projects uh, up on the web. Many, uh, the first two have finished, of course, there in the past. The largely lab-based cognitive load in interpreting translation, or CLINT, which I like very much as an acronym. Um, uh, very Wild West. Uh, we've, got, uh, we've got the cognitive load, into, which is ongoing and about to finish this year. The results, uh, the full results will be published, I think, sometime next year. And a new, uh, very, very promising project that uh, Maureen can tell you much more about than I could on digital literacy in university contexts, uh, which is focusing on the, uh, which our, our part of the project is focusing on MT literacy, which is uh, obviously a feature of the type of work we've been describing up till now and something very much in the forefront of uh, uh, obviously translation industry, but also broader societal concerns. Thank you very much. Well, thank you both very, very much for this. Um, it's, it's always fascinating me how many interesting points you can people can make in such a short, a short space of time. Thank you both. Um, well, I think the, the way it works in academia, you get the money, you do the work, but that's uh, obviously something you've uh, played very well here. Um, I've uh, made a big note to check back on your website to keep up with all the projects. Um, I want to open this up quite widely. Um, so I have this issue that, as usual, I don't think I can immediately see everybody. So if, if you manage to raise your hand, uh, then we will do it by that. Otherwise, um, so I'm a little bit stuck here where uh, I would be able to. See. So I apologize if I don't go in the po uh, in the correct order. Oliver, do you want to make a start? Hello, can you hear me over there? Yeah, yes. we can hear you. Great. Uh, 
Oh, first of all, uh, Marie and Gary, thank you for this uh, great uh, presentation. It was really interesting. I have a small question. I'm not really sure if this story is related, but I would like to know your opinion on that. At the beginning of your presentation, you spoke about the role that uh, technology is playing on the, on the language industry and how it's providing more and more value. So my question is, what is your opinion about how this value is distributed within the language industry? Because at least from the point of view of, at least this is my, my role, uh, language professionals, uh, the problem is no longer how technology is making our life better. I, I believe there is no doubt on that, but how money uh, is not being distributed, at least in a remotely equally way so i i would like to know if first your opinion on that and second if you think academia is is uh, paying attention to this to these issues yes joss morkins is is in the audience i think he can probably uh, address this a bit more than than we can but certainly um it hasn't been distributed to the translators who were doing work and not moving mm -hmm. with the times um, a lot of people have been pushed out of the market. It's absolutely true. What we're finding is that our graduates who are technologically fit and are not committed to doing translation from scratch according to the old methods, they're fine. Um, but people who um, possibly don't have that kind of training, I, I think it hasn't been distributed fairly at all. But I think there's a lot of money going around, and I think that our language uh, specialists should get a cut of it. Uh, I agree totally with what's been said there. And uh, as I said, you know, Joss perhaps could come in and say something more from his experience. We're in a privileged society in Switzerland, of course, where um, pay pay rates are a little bit higher, perhaps, than elsewhere. Um, what I've noticed, though, and I'm to a certain extent strategically for the time left as, as head of the Institute, I'm pinning my hopes on this a little bit, is that while we don't want our students to move completely out of the core services that they're offering, what I'd like to see happening and is increasingly happening as we're observing on the market is that they're moving further upstream, that they are becoming the content, if not directly the content creators, working together with content creators. And there, there's these are more lucrative positions. Um, I'm thinking of corporate communications in particular, where we've seen a particular market niche evolving for people with the same skills that translators have. So, you know, combination uh, briefs that would involve, obviously, post-editing and, and translation in its more classic kind of uh, sense, core service sense, localization, complemented with greater use of uh, the greater upstreaming of, 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 of the potential of translators. And I found find that that has to be done within organizational settings, that the organizations have to wake up to this fact. Now, that's where, again, I see our role as, as very, very important because organizations won't know this until we go in and tell them. And the way to tell them is to start looking at what they're doing and, and working with them and saying, wait a minute, you've got problems here. Uh, classic examples would be uh, large Swiss multilingual companies who, who, who do their corporate communications in, in German and then just get them translated in the classic sense or translated by machines and then quite simply post-edited. That is just not going to work and it alienates the French speakers in, in Switzerland and the Italian speakers let alone the, those, uh, those, 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 those international markets to which they are also, uh, which they're also aiming at. So I see that. Plus also a wider spread. Again, you know, we see this uh, towards the downstream services. And again, we're seeing that um, um, there, is, there is a call for um, um, increased uh, data curation. Now, I don't know to what extent, how well paid that is. I certainly know that, um, that the computer linguists uh, can look forward to an extremely uh, lucrative future. And again, you know, I can see a combination of classic translation skill sets with not deep, perhaps, computer linguistic skills, but certainly useful, hands-on data curation, data management, quality, uh, quality assurance skills 
could be a nice way to ensure a, a slightly more lucrative future for yourselves. But thank you very much for that question. I think it's very, very, very pert pertinent. Thank you. Yes, um, the, uh, to go back to, to, you, to the very beginning of your question, Oliver, I mean, the, the point that technologies make our lives better and that there is no doubt about that. Is that something we are all subscribing, subscribing to? I'm, I think in, in, in the many points that, <laughs> yeah, that Maureen, and maybe I've misunderstood it, but I think in the, in the many points that Maureen and Gary have made, I think the, from the research, it, it becomes to me very clear that um, this is one of the many questions that we have not really fully addressed yet, and that, uh, that this is exactly the whole point of also doing all the ergonomic research to see what are the circumstances that would allow us to integrate technologies in such a way that they are actually making these processes better. I'm sorry if I've misunderstood your um, uh, point there, but uh, maybe we'll leave it there. Um, well, uh, Alexander, do you want to come in next? Yes, yes. Can you hear me okay? Yes, yeah, I can. Great. Yeah. Uh, so first of all, thank you, Gary. Thank you, Maureen, uh, for such a great event. And I have a question about uh, the presence and the future of translation and uh, translation training. So um, the, uh, at one of the first slides that you showed, I like that you called uh, the core person involved in translation, not uh, actually the translator, but already a linguist involved in this process. So, and I have a question uh, concerning uh, if we are all, if, it, if it's technically correct to say that uh, post editing is new translation uh, and whether we should uh, teach our um, students that if they still want to survive in the translation industry of the future, uh, that they should actually uh, be ready for post editing rather than to translation. Uh, on the other hand, what are the signs, what are the markers that would allow us to say that it's no longer translation or pure translation, but post-editing and other processes? Thank you. This reminds me of the debate that was ongoing when I just entered translation studies. Um, I remember going to a talk at, I think it was uh, in Vancouver, and, and people were bemoaning the, the introduction of word processors into the translation process, that this, this was doomed to kill creativity, that one could not translate if you were not doing it pen and paper. And I, I remember thinking, whoa, <laughs> is this where translation studies is? And then we heard the same thing with cat tools, that that was going to destroy creativity and it was not a good thing and it was no longer translation. And we hear the same thing with MT and we now, I mean, convergence, not in the sense of this lecture series and not in the way um, Yap Fantemer uses it, but convergence in terms of technology where you have empty suggestions coming out and cat tools. It's no longer purely post-editing environments. There's still that, that still exists in some contexts, but the reality is that it's another tool in the toolkit. And so I would say, yes, it is part of translation. And what does translation mean? It's not it's not equivalent. It's not finding that match for that word. We know that in translation. It's much more than that. And so it's still a shaping, a producing a text in another language on the basis of what Pim start, calls starting text instead of a source text. And, and I think that that's, that's translation, if that's what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I agree totally with what Maureen says. It's part of the. It's, it's, it's a stage in what is a, a, a superordinate process of uh, of actually text production ultimately. And uh, whether you use it, whether I mean, I'm sure that you know this is a tool as well. By the way, a pen. We can't you know? see it. I mean, it's too cloudy. You, you it's can't too cloudy see here. it. It's too cloudy. But there's a there's there a tool. Uh -huh. That's a pen. I mean, uh, yes, yes, yes. Sure that you know in the same way that I can use this pen, perhaps although I'm a left hander. Um, and I do you therefore use it very badly, but you know I can use uh, MT, uh, I, I can I can I can work on post editing. Um, I think I think the question is is a very interesting one, but I think the question is probably uh, not that whether we should train post editors, but what skills we need to address that can enable people to post edit as long as and as well as do other things. I think this is the big issue. And I think we're looking increasingly at adaptivity. 
we're looking increasingly at, 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 at promoting uh, creativity and adaptivity and responsibility and ownership uh, rather than slavishly working to, by rote to certain systems and strategies. You know, if you get this word or this set of words, do that. You know, the type of stuff we saw in the in the 60s with these books, endless books and lists of words. If you have in game, you translate it as by doing and so on and so forth. That, that, that's over. That's over. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I think um, Joss and Felix, I guess you want to comment directly on those. Joss, you want to go first? Sure, thank you. Um, thanks, Maureen, for sharing your presentation. I have a quick question regarding the transdisciplinary action research idea. So I, I like the idea of this sort of participatory design and actually um, involving participants in the design of research and then broadening that and including uh, potentially translation agencies or companies or employers, but is there a danger of being cross purposes? So you mentioned, Maureen, in your presentation that the, the motivations of the employer are likely to be different. And is there a danger that you can't be critical of the employer or else they might block publication of that research, which of course is a motivation for us as, as researchers, um, or that they, they might want themselves portrayed in a critical way? That has to do with the, um, the contract you make at the very beginning. Um, when we worked with in, in one service provider, they wanted us to tell their name. They wanted us to have their name on our website. Um, and then we were just careful not to be critical of them, but we were critical of the processes or possibly um, talked about how this could impede things but not they're doing it wrong. It has to do with how you present that, how you frame those discussions as well. And, uh, and uh, if I might add to that, one of the, one of the it's, it's certainly not our idea. It, the, the, the idea comes from, as I said, other, other, other spheres and, the trans, and transferring it into applied, um, you know, applied linguistics really. Uh, didn't come from us. It came from our sister institute, the Applied, uh, the Institute of Applied Media Studies, which uh, headed up by Daniel Perrin, and um, and it was the, the the concept behind it was born of an experience he had when he was involved in a in a in a research and consultancy project with the Swiss TV, uh, Idee Swiss, they were called, and um, it was on that basis that that the model was developed and. Um, I, it seems again that what the, the 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 problem there were no problems regarding publication there were no problems regarding um, 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 outreach obviously it's a public organisation so they have to be transparent but um, it was I think the response was and we I, I I see this increasingly when we're talking to industry partners it's great to have you on board because you're doing stuff with us and for us that we can't afford to do ourselves and we don't have time to do ourselves so I mean there's a give and take there of course but in the end I'm optimistic that this would only happen in in very rare situations where of course you know you you come across certain situations that that organizations would not want to publicize. But as Maureen says, you can also talk about that in the contract. There can be controversial uh, confidentiality clauses built in. I think this is, I'm sorry, Felix, I know you also raised your hand. I think this is a really pertinent question that many of, or I, I, I know we've come across this year as well. And to me also, it has two different sides. I meant to ask you, in fact, um, what about the sort of the, the realism of this? Um, but I think you've partly answered that. Um, so you have obviously been successful in actually securing such collaborations, which I think is not necessarily um, that easy. So that means you know the, the, the skill to sort of open these doors to to work um, in 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 ways with industry partners that that allow you to do what you have just described. Mm -hmm. um, but then for me, there's also another side that. Um, the, this may become less of an issue if, if you don't just think of the industry partners, but it's about all stakeholders and user communities. And I'm, I, I think that's what you most probably meant. I mean, I'm, I'm looking at that often in the context of some of the research we are doing here that has to do with media accessibility or generally sort of access where it's about linguistic minorities and mm -hmm. where I think you, you, you can actually not do that research without 
that's having right. these user communities on board. And then that's also a, a sort of a counterbalance between yeah, the developers, the makers, the users, so that you that you have them all on board. And I, I think that's, I mean, in the UK, this is often referred to as co-creation or co-design of the research, even right from the start, which exactly. which I do think this is the way to go, but that doesn't mean it's without any, it's without risk. So I think, um, Alexander, I think you raised the question. I think this is a really pertinent question that we all have to ask to ask ourselves. But anyway, so I'm sorry, Felix, I uh, used the privilege of hosting of charities to just make my own comment. I, 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 I know you also wanted to comment. Come on. Yeah, so um, uh, I wanted to comment on um, the evolution of the discipline of translation studies. Um, Maureen and Gary, you've always been very focused on uh, advanced research in, in translation studies and this idea of transdisciplinary action research is it's I agree with you it's a way for us to increase the focus and the, re the relevance of the discipline but at the same time uh, uh, so the plan would be to improve practice to uh, improve something right so ideally it would also contribute to improving the value of translation. Mm -hmm. um, but I also see a, a, a trend in the discipline that for me, I interpret it as reducing the value of translation. Because for example, every discussion that we have in terms of where we are adding the value, it's not in the core work of translation, but everything around it. It's mm -hmm. in the technology. It's in the new uh, roles that translators play. Uh, so even the name changes, no longer translation no longer specialized in translation, but something else. So what's your opinion about this? Uh, as a discipline, how can we contribute to increasing the value, the perception of the value of translation if we are looking less and less to these core um, values and always talking about what we add to them? I'm going to um, respond to what you said about the word. And, and I've been advocating recently, actually since about 2016, that we don't talk about translation anymore because it outside our community, people understand translation to be a problem that has been solved by Google and DeepL. And when our students come to us and, and they, they say they talk to their friends that they're going to study translation, people look at them like, what? Why would you want to study that? It just, it just is done. It's like studying dishwashing, I think. And I, I don't know um, the answer to your question. I do think that um, what I, I choose to call multilingual text production is incredibly interesting. And everybody agrees that text production is something inherently human or creation of texts is something inherently human. And if you can do that from one to another, one language to another, whatever you choose to call that, that's something very special. But I'll let Gary add his. Yeah, I, know. I mean, I think it's an extremely good question, Felix. We've had this debate, do you remember, in the panel that we had at the EST a while back, and uh, I think we suggested at some stage, or I suggested that we perhaps rebrand translation as something else. And, and you quite pertinently said, well, why do we need to? Why do we need to? Because the skills are there, and we know that. I think it's to do with the visibility more than anything else. And I think that uh, this idea, as you, you, you rightly point out, in a sense, we're kind of running away from the core business, you know, going upstream and downstream and things. But if the same people are doing this, uh, this would be a very useful metaphor for showing the world at large that actually translation per se is exactly that. There is no distinction. It would actually break down the barriers. And uh, part of the, I mean, I like the image, perhaps the uh, the visualization that, that it, it's my fault. What I came up with is a bit weird because you've got a, you know, a little tiny kind of core circle and then you've got blocks here and there. The concept of the stream is perhaps more interesting because it is a continuum. And the more people can see that what we call translators are able to do content creation and do it well and do downstream work in quality assurance and so on, do that well, the more likely it is that the profession itself will gain in that type of positive visibility that has been lacking. Uh, the problem is so often that translation is associated with a mechanical process. And let's be honest, translation studies has had a hand in this in the past, in de fruitless debates about equivalence. It's ridiculous. There is, I mean, sorry, you know, yes, to a certain extent, there is a proximity of meaning between a source document and a target document and what have you. But ultimately, there's always intervention involved. 
And it's crazy to think that that's not the case. Um, anybody who's taught a class of 10 translation students will know that, that you're never going to have the same translation twice. And uh, the point is that we should, we should draw more attention to that intervention's role because that is what intercultural mediation is. That is what intercultural communication is. That is what communication should be. It's not just one-to-one. -one. It's not the way what I think is set is, is perfectly expressed and perfectly understood by the other person. Of course, there's an interpretation involved and the interpretation across language barriers is going to be there and the in, in intervention is going to be there. And I think that should be celebrated actually. And uh, the way we've seen uh, or thought we could do it at our, uh, in, 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 our, in the way we're training our students is to create a situation where they can be adaptive and you do these roles and by, as I said, metaphorically in a sense, by becoming trans creators or calling themselves content creators, people will, in the world outside will suddenly say, actually, translation isn't that easy, is it? It's not that one-to-one. -one. That's how I see it. But as, 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 as the Germans say, I'll translate directly, hope dies last. <laughs> That does and that shows you that word to word, <laughs> one, word by word is not a good idea. Exactly. We talk about language mediation a lot, and whether that'll catch on or not, I don't know. But Gary and and I and our institute have been talking more about language mediators because it has this this interventionist role built in and away from the mechanical. Yes, of course. I mean, uh, maybe the machines now do the translation, right? And we do something more sophisticated than exactly, that. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. That's the point. That's, that's the, the point. point. That's the point. That's, that's the point. point. Yeah. That's really brilliantly put. <laughs> yes. Uh, I think I, I think we we need to have lots of fantastic researchers to, like you to discuss all of these things and uh, to really see where the future is. Mm -hmm. uh, there are so many things going on. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, I think that's also to some extent the case in a in other disciplines, it's always difficult to know what to compare it with, but certainly it's the case in mathematics that um, what we used to do by hand yeah. is, is done by a machine. And I exactly. think it wouldn't occur to a mathematician to give up the name mathematics as a discipline. So, you know, that's why I'm thinking, I, I know where you're coming from, but are we really, you know, is that really the solution that we, that we sort of sacrifice the, the name of a discipline that over the decades has happily grown into you know, I mean, it's translation, it's interpreting, it's all the hybrid modes in between, it's intermodal translation, so it's also not just language, it's we translate from images to text and all of those things. So that's the, and I think Margaret also made an interesting comment. I mean, there have always been, uh, I don't know, Margaret, whether you want to comment on your comment, but always been misunderstandings about what uh, what translation involves and doesn't involve. So that's just thinking, really, are we ready to give up the, you know, the the cover term or yeah I, I i would just argue that with the mathematics analogy my brother is a mathematician um and he didn't know how to use a calculator because what calculators can do is not related to what he does as a mathematician and i think that 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 distinction has not yet made its way in our discipline so what people understand outside as translation is this mechanical arithmet arithmetical kind of thing and what we understand of course is something mm. very different mm. yeah. Yeah, I know the analogy is not. No, no, it's a thing. lot of people yeah. use things like that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I know. yeah but I think the analogy, oh, sorry. sorry, I think the analogy is a clever, is, 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 is a good one. And it's a good question because, I mean, you know, uh, we, as I said, we've got a sister institute of media studies, which is basically journalism and organizational communication, corporate communication, so on and so forth. But, you know, what's happened uh, in translation over the last 15 years is now happening in journalism, of course. Mm -hmm. But again, you know, they, they don't recall, they don't rebrand themselves something else in journalists. They still call themselves journalists, but they say, basically, very cynically, being journalists, <laughs> I'd like to see a mach uh, machine do the research I'm doing. And I'd like to see a machine uh, negotiate in the way I'm doing. So basically, they are pointing to the, to the in a sense, human, the, elements. The human elements there. Fine. Anyway, I'll stop. <laughs> Interesting. Um, Anna? Yeah, um, thank you. Um, thank you very much, uh, Maureen and Gary, for this really fascinating talk. And um, 
carrying on with the discussion on the the name translation the label uh, we recently uh, did a, a an extensive program review of our MA translation program here at Surrey and we were in two minds on whether uh, because the contents of our review indicated this updating and extension of the role of the translator uh, a much wider role and a much wider um, skills required beyond, you know, the actual um, thing that machines do. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and we were in two minds on whether we should change the name of the program or whether we should keep it MA translation. And um, I'm sure we, we have lots of MA students here, MA in translation and MA, MA in translation and interpreting. And I was wondering if some of the students in the audience here could perhaps comment on that. Would you have come to us um, had our MA not been MA translation, but MA in language uh, mediation or, or some other kind of uh, broader name. So I was wondering if any of our students here in the audience would like to comment. Sorry to put you in the <laughs> spotlight. Yeah. Maybe not, but maybe, maybe Margaret, you want to, I, I don't know Margaret, whether you want to just uh, comment on your own comment actually. Why the students are thinking also. <laughs> right, well, yeah, we we'll always give students time to think. Um, hi, everybody, and thank you so much, Maureen and Gary. Nice to see you. Likewise, and, likewise. Yeah, likewise. Nice to see you, Margaret. Thanks. Um, yeah, um, Sabina asked me whether I wanted to add anything. I mean, just looking, I can see lots of things, lots of questions re-emerging now under a different guise. You know, I think they're fundamentally very similar questions that we've always had about translation and about training. Um, but of course, they are much more influenced now by technology. But I mean, I can think back in the 80s, in the early days of uh, MA in translation, where um, a new student said to me, well, if I'd known I had to use a computer on this course, I would never have applied. Um, because we were insisting, in, even in the early days, that at least students typed up their translation and presented it in a professional way. So they got away from this, what in German, Papierdenken. And, and mm -hmm. anyway, um, I mean, that was uh, eons ago. Um, but I think another issue with training, which we've always had, is anticipating um, future needs of the translators. And not only in the longer term, but in the shorter term. Because as we became much more international in the cohorts of students that uh, came to us for um, training. Then, of course, they go back to their own countries and, and the sort of mm -hmm. subjects that they were translating or the sort of tools that they would have available to them were vastly different. Mm -hmm. And so we were trying to find um, ways in which we could offer something which was not so generic that it was useless, but mm -hmm. didn't um, exclude many of our students from working in uh, real jobs when they went back to their own countries. I mean, because um, I'm talking also about some of the days before we had such global networks of electronic communication. Um, but I still think that that, that probably is some, some kind of issue. Um, just a small anecdote that in the, I think it was in the noughties, um, we tried at Surrey to introduce a, an MA program which focused on technology and translation. And it didn't work. You know, we ran it for two or three years, but um, we then had to give it up and, and reconfigure. Um, because at the time, I think uh, we did a bit of a marketing survey and we discovered that the uh, applicant thought that if they did this program, all they would ever be doing is working with, with, with computers. I mean, things have changed now from the statistics that you showed us. This is the majority way of working I and mean, 80% stuck in my head. Um, but 
um, what I'm saying is that perceptions of, of what their future role will be in all respects, I think, has always been a major factor. And dealing with that when we design curricula um, has been a problem. But as I said at the beginning, perhaps these days with different perspectives, but I think the underlying problems can be very similar. Thank you. Thank you, Margaret. That is very interesting. Um, yes, of course, I remember that we had this MA and it didn't uh, take off. But then again, I, so we have um, interesting uh, comments in the in the chat. I think the vote is more or less for the word MA for the um, MA translation. But uh, mm -hmm. does anybody uh, anybody else any thoughts on this particular topic for our students in particular? I think our students have probably voted. Um, A lot of them have put it messages in the chat it yes. seems mm, to be yeah. people want it huh yeah i i i, I can fully understand that i yeah. mean and uh, i'm not advocating changing the name I'm, i think the name will or, or the, the, the 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 diversification in the professions yeah. will lead mm. inevitably to a mm. plurality of names with gray zones in between and 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 a continuum of of activities from the extremely creative to perhaps the 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 the, the less creative the the more technologically oriented. Um, uh, we, we, we will use translation. We have to use translation because it's the word that is in the, uh, 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 the, the government lists of employment. That is, that is the word, translation interpreting. Until that changed, we will use translation. I think it's less to do with the name and more to do, uh, or the label, and more to do with, uh, with, with, with how you perceive the human being in that role. Mm. And our strategy... Uh, on top of this, and I think um, what Margaret said is very interesting because we're experiencing the same thing. The people who come to us, the people classically interested in communication and multilingual communication, do not want to be slaves to the technology. They see themselves in a human interventionist role. And I think it's important that we show them that that is possible. So our strategy is to emphasize increasingly and everywhere what we call the, uh, the human value added in the professions um, to, to, to say, look, wait a minute, you know, there's this in the machines, but, but you are there, it's your position. And I think what we have to do is change the mindset. And I think, again, we, there are professional ramifications for this. Perhaps David Catan is still listening. I know he said he wanted to listen to this this evening, but I agree totally when David says, part of the reason we're so hamstrung by this are certain ways in which a translation is conceptualized by the translation organizations themselves. The concept of being a neutral, a neutral conduit, conduit. Yeah. who just takes a message and then comes up with some equivalent is, I think, something that increasingly, as Felix said, is what the machines are doing mm -hmm. and will be doing. Mm -hmm. And we just have to show that it's not just that. Yeah, let the machines do what they do best and let us do what we do best. So maybe these were wise words um, to conclude this session. I don't think we can put it much better, but um, I do also think, yes, we should advocate for, of course, you know, a wide coverage of, of what we are doing rather than this, this uh, segmentation into all kinds of small things that ultimately achieve part of the same thing. But I think it's very important that that it doesn't get too fragmented and that people outside our world, so to say, realize that it's all got a common core and, uh, and that the human being is uh, in the middle of this, yeah. So I don't see any other hands up. Um, and uh, yes, it's, it's getting late in some places and <laughs> depending on where you are, um, probably too late. Um, we, uh, yes, we started it uh, at a slightly unusual hour, but it doesn't matter. So thank you both again very much. You. I think you can see from the even from the discussion, which was of course too short, um, that this is such an interesting topic that um, I hope it won't be too long uh, before we have you back talking to us and we can actually continue this discussion uh, in many different forms. Thank you awesome. both very much and thank you everybody for joining us and we, well, we hope you stay with us for next year. We will of course do many more of those next year. Well, thank, thank you. you very much for the invitation. It was very thank kind you. of you. Yes. Thank you very much. Right. We enjoyed it very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you very Bye -bye. much. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm.